Are these cosmic signs a result of elite leaders tampering with the Earth's atmosphere? Or could they be the last warning from God to the unrepentant that the Lord is about to intervene? Could both things be true? What do you think? So welcome uh, those of you that are online and on uh, video. Uh, we are going slowly through the book of Revelation. Uh, there will be 22 studies in the end when we're finally finished. And we are up to number seven, study seven. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we're going to be focusing on just a few verses because in those verses is so much content and we can easily just read by it and not really take in what uh, the full scope uh, of what is there in those few verses. And so we're looking at the opening of the sixth seal. We've already gone through five seals as they're opened of the scroll that is given to the Lord Jesus from the Father in chapter 4 and 5, uh, where he comes before the throne and he's given the scroll. The scroll has seven seals and there's an effect on earth at the breaking of each seal. And we are now up to the breaking of the sixth seal and so there are cosmic disturbances, hence the title for tonight is The Sixth Seal, Cosmic Disturbances. And tonight we're going to look at what causes these cosmic disturbances. And we can't be dogmatic, but we're going to throw out one or two things that uh, could be meant by these cosmic disturbances. Why? will these cosmic disturbances take place on earth? So let's get into it. In our first, in our last two studies, we, we have been looking at chapter 6. We're, we're going at different speeds determined by the content. So chapter 6, we are taking three studies to look at chapter 6 alone. Chapter 7, we'll take two studies to look at uh, the content of chapter 7. And then I think chapter 8 and chapter 9, we've put those two chapters together. So uh, the, the content of each chapter determines how much uh, we'll get into it. So this chapter 6, there's much to be unpacked, and that's what we're attempting to do. We don't know everything, but uh, we're just looking up close. Instead of skimming over the top, we, we want to examine well, what does this mean? Our goal is, what does it say? What does it mean? And how do we put these scriptures to work in our lives? So the last two studies of chapter 6 was the four horsemen of the apocalypse, was, was the unpacking of the four seals. And then we, we looked in our previous study, the fifth seal and the great tribulation. And what we said is that God is revealing to us a seven-year period spoken of by the prophet Daniel in chapter 9, verses 27 of that book. And in the middle of that uh, seven-year period, Daniel writes that there's an event in the middle of that seven-year period. He calls it the abomination of desolation. And a lot of people would say, well, that's funny because Antiochus Epiphanes IV, uh, did a, he sacrificed a pig and he set up an image. This is a Greek general that, that captured Palestine in 167 BC. He slaughtered a pig in the holy place. And some people say that is the abomination of desolation. And sure, to Jewish minds, that is an abomination, but 167 years later, well, more like 200 years later, 32 AD approximately, uh, the Lord Jesus said that there was another thing he called the abomination of desolation. So we believe this abomination of desolation is spoken of taking place in the middle of the seven years. 
And last time we talked about what Jesus said would occur after that event. Uh, we believe that that event will be a desecration of the temple, a new rebuilt temple that will be in Jerusalem. And, uh, and straight after that, Jesus warned that when you see that take place, the abomination of desolation, then, then uh, get out of town, basically my paraphrase, of course. Uh, if you're in the mountains, don't go back to get your things. If you're on the roof, don't go back down, just get out of the city, for then there will be great tribulation. And we took a lot of time last study to examine what was meant by the great tribulation. The Greek word is thlipsis, thlipsis. And it actually means a heavy downward pressure, usually in a great trial of people's faith. And we believe it should be translated as great persecution because nowadays people don't, we don't use that word. How often do you ever say, oh, my, my daughter was going through tribulation? No, we, we don't use that word. Or, so so it, we think it should be translated as persecution because what happens then, we looked at in the fifth seal, is obviously great persecution and martyrdom of believers. And we said that right in that fifth seal, there will be those that are martyred for their faith, and they'll be crying out, Lord, when will you? When will you judge those on the earth? Remember when we talked about that? And we brought out, why would they be crying out for judgment unless judgment had not even started yet. And there are some people, God bless them, that believe that all of the seals are the wrath of God being poured out. And so some believe that the rapture will occur before those seals are even opened. That is not uh, my belief from the scriptures. And I think I've taken great pains to show you different things, and we will look further at that because in my my belief the wrath of God has still not taken place and only begins to take place at this sixth seal and the Lord warns us that when you see these cosmic disturbances right following that is the wrath of God being poured out and we will look at that before we read what happens at the opening of the sixth seal, let's look at one or two other things that we are told will occur during the Great Tribulation. Great Tribulation is the King James Version. Great Distress is the NIV's translation. It's a period of time where all believers that are, that are on the earth should take great care when you see that sign, the abomination of desolation. Jesus warned that the situation on earth at that time would look very bleak. Go into, and, and if you've been with us, we're looking at chapter 6 of the book of Revelation and skipping over to Matthew 24 and noticing that they're almost exactly the same. And they should be because they're both inspired by the same writer, the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus. And in Matthew 24, verse 22, the Lord says these words about the period of time we are looking at. If those days had not been cut short, notice those words, we'll talk about that in a minute. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, who's the elect? God's people, the born-again believers that are on earth at that time, they are the elect. Those days will be shortened. So the great tribulation or the great distress is a persecution and martyrdom of God's people. It will be cut short of the entire three and a half year period. This Greek word translated in English by the phrase cut short means to maim 
or amputate or to cut something short of its expected length. Like a bough of a tree sticking out, it's cut short. It's lopped off, we would say. Uh, so the expected time of three and a half years after the abomination of desolation will be cut short by the intervention of the Lord to snatch up, we're talking about the rapture here, those who are in covenant relationship with him by his sacrificial death on the cross. Then will begin the wrath of God. So we don't know how long the church all over the world must endure this tribulation or persecution before it is cut short by the intervention of the Lord. Jesus went on to warn, and that goes along with the scripture, because no man knows the day nor the hour. If it was to the very end of the three and a half years, then we'd know the day or the hour. But no, this... This period of time is cut short. No man knows the day nor the hour. We will be, those of us that are around for that period of time, we won't know whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, when the Lord will intervene. We just know that the time does not go to the whole three and a half years. So Jesus went on to warn us about some other things that will happen during the Great Tribulation. Let's look at... Matthew 24, verse 23. And notice how he starts this out. At that time. There's a reason why he gives us uh, that time frame. He's taking us through major events in that seven-year period. But later on in the book of Revelation, just as he did in Matthew 24, he'll focus on certain events within that period of time. But... At the moment, he's going chronologically through that period of time. That's why he uses the word at that time. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. And if you're a born-again believer, you know that you, you have the Holy Spirit. You know where you're going when you die. You are the elect. God has earmarked you before the foundation of the world. We haven't got time to get into all of that, we, to, to unpack all of that. But that is the long, short, and tall of it. If you're in Christ... You are in Christ because you've been called out of this world to serve the living God. So, verse, if possible, even the elect. Verse 25, see, I have told you ahead of time. Why does he say that? Because it will be great encouragement to those who are experienced in that time to look in the scriptures and see, Jesus told us exactly these things and they're happening right in front of our eyes. So Jesus reminds, look, I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time about this. Verse 26. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the west is visible, it comes from the east, sorry, comes from the east, is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Hmm. If you have the King James Version, it says the eagles. The words at that time are the Lord showing us that he was talking chronologically, taking us through the major events, and then later on we'll go back and look at specific things, like the mark of the beast, for instance. We are to guard our hearts against those who will try to deceive us. And if you've got your eyes on what's happening in this world, there is major deception already at work, and the enemy wants to deceive this is a spiritual war we're in, 
There may be physical wars going on in various places, but there is a spiritual war of deception to keep you from the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. There, is, uh, there are and will be New Age prophets who will tell you of another Jesus, the cosmic Jesus. And if you've read anything about the, the New Age movement, oh, they've got a new Jesus for you. He's nothing like the Jesus we read about in the scriptures. And there is an, an agenda behind the supernatural signs. And, and Jesus warns us, hey, look, just because they've got supernatural signs, that don't mean nothing. Brothers and sisters, when we see supernatural signs, we must look at the fruit that comes from those New Age prophets. There is an agenda behind the signs purporting to come from aliens or beings from another universe. Because they'll say, oh no, we've just been seeded by aliens from another planet and we, we must welcome these beings from another planet. Oh, there is so much deception that goes along with all of that garbage. And I, I hope you haven't given it the second thought. But they will seek to present another Jesus to you and we are told, don't you go out to see them. Don't give them any credence. Why? Because as the lightning goes from the east to the west and lightens up the whole heavens, we are told that is how the Lord will come. You won't have to go looking, oh, I've got to go to that town, or I've heard he's in that town. No, no. He is going to come. The brightness of the heavens will show us the Lord Jesus when he comes. So the, the Lord made it very clear that when he comes, every eye on earth will see him. His coming will brighten the darkness of the time, and there will be no doubt at all who Christ is when he comes. Verse 28 speaks of whatever moral, wherever moral corruption is taking place, there will be vultures. There's two ways of looking at this verse, and that's puzzled me for years. What's it talking about vultures or eagles? And what, 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 corruption, what, dead bodies. So what, what is this? So is this speaking of the corruption that will attract judgment as in the vultures? That's how I've looked at it in the past, but I saw another interpretation today in the Message Bible. Let me read it to you. Verse 28 in the Message Bible says this, Whenever you see crowds gathering, think of carrion vultures circling. Like the picture is of when there's a dead body, guess what? The, the vultures are all appearing. And this way he's interpreting it is just because you see loads of people coming around a false Christ, don't give any credence to it. Because when he comes, you'll know you haven't got a... Just because lots of people are going along with the, the agenda that we are being presented, don't give any credence to it. He carries on. Moving in, hovering over a rotting carcass, you can be quite sure that it's not the living son of man pulling in these crowds. And I kind of like that. I kind of... I think he's got some uh, good idea of just because you see loads and loads of people and, and there are some churches like that, that are thousands and thousands of people, you've got to wonder, well, well, we won't go there. Let's now concentrate on the chronological timeline revealed to us as happening at the opening of the sixth seal. For before Christ's coming... There will be cosmic signs. So let's now look at the sixth seal opened. Let's read the passage, verses 12 to 14. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. Take note of that. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth 
as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Wow, this is awesome. This says an amazing amount of information. He's describing cosmic things that if we are on earth at that time, those that are on earth at that time will be horrified uh, that such things uh, as being described here to take place. So the Jewish prophets and seers saw a time when the earth would be shattered and a tide of destruction would flow over the old world before the new world was born. They saw this period of time that we're talking about now when the most reliable things in the universe would become disorderly and chaos would reign. So let me ask you a question, give you a chance to introduce yourself at the table and, and, and talk about this question. Are these cosmic signs a result of elite leaders tampering with the Earth's atmosphere or could they be the last warning from God to the unrepentant that the Lord is about to intervene. Could both things be true? What do you think? I'll give you a few minutes just to ponder, discuss. I think we could be all night just talking about that question. <laughs> Did I stir up a hornet's nest? <laughs> let's, let's go on. When the sixth seal is broken... Cosmic signs begin to happen, which leads us to ask three questions about what causes these cosmic signs to occur. And we, again, we can't be dogmatic about this. We're just examining and trying to think through what could cause this. But at this point in history, we might not be able to understand these events before they actually take place but we can be watchful and have our eyes open and our hearts prepared as we see end-time events approaching, knowing that Jesus warned us that these things would take place. So number one, the first question, are the cosmic signs the result of the leaders of the earth reaping what they have sown? What do I mean? Well, you're all well aware that in the 1950s and the 1960s, the U.S. government tested more and more powerful nuclear weapons deep down under the Earth's surface. And that wasn't just the United States. There was certainly Russia, China, North Korea has tested, South, South Africa has even tested nuclear weapons. Pakistan has tested nuclear weapons. But nowadays, they do it under the ground. But we don't know what those things are actually doing with such powerful explosions. Can new, more powerful tests cause great earthquakes or seismic activity? Also, weather manipulation has been going on for decades. China recently admitted to seeding the clouds to control the weather during their Communist China centennial celebration. It sounds like the stuff of science fiction, doesn't it? But in fact, the first cloud seeding experiment was performed in 1946. The weather has been manipulated since that point. Cloud seeding is done by shooting silver iodide particles into the clouds to attract water droplets to modify the weather. Some scientists have expressed concerns that altering rainfall distribution could influence weather patterns, causing water scarcity in some places and flooding in others. Do we really know the consequences of these efforts or how they may be misused for evil intent? The Lord warned us centuries ago 
about a time that is now here when the earth itself will be defiled by its people. I'm focusing on Isaiah 24, verses 4 to 6, which says these words. Verse 4. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The heavens languish with the earth. The earth is defiled by its people. Other translations use the word raped by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth and its people must bear their guilt. So let's examine that. That's heavy duty stuff, right? <laughs> what could be referred to as the laws and the statutes that have been disobeyed by scientists and evil leaders of the earth? Consider one of the projects, just, just one, we'll just focus on one of the projects that our leaders have spent more money on than the whole of the U.S. space program. I'm talking about the Large Hadron Collider, or CERN, C-E-R-N, as it's often called. It is humanity's largest particle collider, and it is a circular 17-mile long, 27 kilometers, tunnel, 300 feet under the French-Swiss border, ringed by magnets. The magnets accelerate streams of particles, usually protons, sometimes other things, to enormous speeds, then crash them into one another. Scientists study these collisions where unusual particles sometimes emerge to search for a, as yet unseen building blocks of the universe. As of writing June 2024, the most significant project in human history is still facing difficulties in getting up and running smoothly. And there is also talk, I was looking at it today, studying this, there's talk now of doubling the size of that Hadron Collider to 32 miles. They are looking for the building blocks of life itself, how creation started, and what holds it together. The mind boggles <laughs> at such things. The Higgs boson particle, also referred to as the God particle. Outside the main building is a statue of a Hindu god by the name of Shiva, a dancing god of destruction. <laughs> hey, what, what is going on here? Stephen Hawking, the famous theoretical physicist who is not a Christian, had concerns about this project and made his views known. He warned the hundreds of particle physicists that they were opening Pandora's box. And once it was opened, we would not be able to put back in what comes out. Here's what he wrote in his book, and I quote, The Higgs potential has the worrisome feature that it might become meta metastable at energies above 100 billion giga electron volts. This could mean that the universe could undergo catastrophic vacuum decay with a bubble of the true vacuum expanding at the speed of light. This could happen at any time and we wouldn't see it coming. The darkening of the sun and the moon turning blood red, and I've got a couple of links there so you can explore that more of... Uh, a Christian's point of view as to what's happening there and also a scientific point of view. So it is possible, and again, we can't be dogmatic about these things. We can just look at these things and what are these people up to? Why are they messing around with such things? The darkening of the sun and the moon turning blood red could also 
be the result of air pollution caused by nuclear explosions on Earth's surface during what happens as the second seal is opened, war. In nuclear explosions, and I did a study of this when I, when I was young, that was one of the things that uh, really propelled me to try and do something. I, I, I was young, I was passionate, I started going on the streets warning people, look, do we know what's going on? Even before I was a Christian, I was on the streets giving out leaflets and warning people about such things. And uh, one of the things I learned was that uh, I, I, did a, I got a government study on the result of the Nagasaki and the Hiroshima nuclear explosions. And in that study, in-depth study, produced by the U.S. government. In that study, it said that when the explosion went off in Hiroshima, the dust was rose up really high into the upper atmosphere, and once it got up to such, the heat brought it all up. And then once it got into the upper atmosphere, it spread out and darkened the sun. Isn't that interesting? And yet here we have the sun will be darkened. Will it? Will that be what causes it? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just a fisherman throwing out ideas uh, that's come to know the word of God and throwing out these things and saying, well, do we really know what we're doing? And seeing this crazy world falling apart at the seams. And, uh, and then... What did John see when he described the stars falling to earth? How can that be possible? We, we say that, but I, I, I always wondered, how, the, how on earth? I was studying this 46, 47 years ago. That was how I came to Christ. How could the stars fall from the sky, I said. But John could be seeing, and remember, he's watching this He's got no frame of reference like we have. He's watching this. This is a revelation. I believe he's actually seeing it. The Lord is showing him, and he's writing things down as to what he sees. So it could be that he is seeing showers of meteorites coming down, or it could be, and we've already read about a great earthquake, and the ground underneath people is shifting. So it could be that the earth itself is moving on its axis. How can I say that? Well, have you ever read the book of Isaiah, chapter 24, verses 19 to 23? Let's read it and try and examine what the prophet is writing about. Verse 19, the earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. Anyone ever seen a drunk tottering backwards and forwards, can't maintain his balance? That's what he's describing. <laughs> the earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls, never to rise again. In that day, what day? The day when cosmic occurrences begin to take place. In that day, Yahweh, the Lord, capitalized here, will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. And many of you have been crying out for judgment and justice. We want justice so bad. But God is telling of a time when their just, justice and judgment will come. Verse 22. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. Why does it say many days? Remember, the, 
the millennium is a thousand years and the rest of the dead will not come to life until after that thousand. Until that time, they're kept in prison. And that's exactly what it's saying here. Verse 23, the moon will be abashed. The sun ashamed. It's describing cosmic occurrences. If you're ashamed, what do you do? You kind of hide your face away. It's a picture. And I, I went and checked out the Hebrew words and what it meant, but it literally means that. It's, it's very aware of its shame and trying to hide. Uh, so that, that is exactly the picture we've read in the book of Matthew where, where Jesus says the sun will be darkened and the moon turn to blood red. So that is what we're seeing in another confirmation, another passage. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will, hallelujah, reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. And what a day, brothers and sisters, that will be when Jesus comes and sits on his throne and these wretched creatures that are destroying the earth will be put into prison. And it says, which we'll get on to next, talking about the, the powers in the heavens. What on earth is that? The powers will be punished. The Lord will punish the powers in the heavens. So if you're standing on the earth and the earth is actually tottering, it would seem as if the stars would be falling. Could that be it? I, I don't know. I'm just throwing out thoughts of what it could be explained as. So what a terrible and awesome sight. And this passage in Isaiah chapter 24 leads us to the second possibility as to what causes the cosmic sign. So number two. Are these cosmic signs supernatural manifestations taking place in the heavenly realms as Michael the archangel casts down Satan and evil angelic forces to the earth? And that's what we just read, right? That there will be punishment in the heavenly realms. That's exactly what it said. The Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above. Can that be possible? Well, that's exactly what's going on on earth. If you could, so many of us, we can't see the wood because we're looking at the trees. We look so closely at things and we can't see the big picture of what's happening on earth. We're in the midst of a spiritual war between a dark, malevolent spiritual being called Satan and uh, his horde of demons. And there will be a point where Michael the archangel will cast him down from his position. We often think of Satan as being in hell, but that's not the picture that is in the scriptures in the, in the New Testament. He is an unseen, powerful being that is... Uh, behind things. He, he operates in the heavenly realms, the unseen realms uh, around the earth. And the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens. This reminds us of exactly the war that's going on. Remember Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12? We'll put it on the screen behind us. Paul, the apostle, writes to the church at Ephesus, and he says, for our struggle, for our wrestling, hopefully you're wrestling and you're, st you're struggling uh, with this dark force that is out to harm you in any way, shape, or form he possibly can. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Have you ever looked and, uh, closely at things that's going on and wondered, well, is this 
part of the spiritual war that's going on that Jesus has already won the victory for us and delivered us, but this war still carries on until the Lord intervenes. Now, Job 38, verse 7, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and Isaiah 14, verse 12, likens angels, both evil and good, as stars. Could this reference to the stars being thrown down in our passage in Revelation be a reference to Satan and his angels being cast down to earth? Again, we cannot be dogmatic about such things, but it is possible, for we are told of such a thing happening in Revelation 12. Let's look at that passage. Yet we haven't got to Revelation 12. It's still several weeks in front of us. But we're just going to skip ahead and look at that to clarify, is these cosmic things happening a result of evil spiritual beings being cast down? Here's what it says, verse 7 of Revelation 12. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. The dragon is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. That ancient... Uh, I, I skipped a line. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place. Where? In heaven. The great dragon, verse 9, was hurled down. And, and we have a clarification on who the dragon is. He tells us that ancient serpent, and any biblical student knows what he's talking about. That ancient serpent takes us back to Genesis 3 when the serpent appeared before Adam and Eve. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled. He wasn't asked, please go to earth, get out of here. No, he was hurled down. There's war going on and he's hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, anyone been under the accusation of the evil one lately? He accuses us before our God day and night has been hurled down. Then the result of that war, that God, we already looked at that, there'll be a war on earth because when he comes down, he will persecute the church. And we'll look at that further on. They overcame him. Who's the they? Us, believers that are on the earth at that time, they overcame him by what? Their testimony. The blood of the Lamb... Because they know that the blood of the Lamb has conquered the evil one. The blood of the Lamb has redeemed us, has bought us out of the evil one's hand. The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. What's that? We know that we know that we know that our God has redeemed us to himself by the blood of Jesus Christ that he paid for there at the cross of Christ. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And that's what we talked about in seal 5, that the martyrs, there will be those believers that will be martyred at that time. And they'll be told, no, you've just got to take this mark. Come on, take it. And you'll get the world. You'll be able to have this and that. And they'll say, no way, Jose. <laughs> I am not going to take your mark. And uh, I am... I'm willing to die for my Lord Jesus Christ who has died for me so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. That's where persecution 
and warfare happens on earth because he wants to get you to worship him. We already talked about that. He is filled with fury. There we go. We, we, we look at the, the first five seals and we say, that, that's got to be the wrath of God. No, the fury of the enemy. There's a war that's going on that will be manifested on the earth plane. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He knows when he gets down, he is thinking, oh, I only got so much time to harass these believers. So when these demonic forces are cast down, it is terrible for earth's occupants, for Satan knows that he has little time left. And I believe that that will be a glorious time for those of us that are on earth. If, if any of us are still, we don't know when that time will be. It may be 10 years or maybe 20, maybe 50 years. We, we just can't tell at this point. But we know that the enemy has little time to muster his forces against the coming of the Lord. So, these cosmic signs, back to the cosmic signs, are also spoken of as happening just before the day of the Lord begins, as told in Matthew and Mark's Gospels. Matthew writes in accord with the book of Revelation about cosmic signs in the sky. And remember, in our last two studies, we've been jumping from Revelation to Matthew. So should we see the same things in the, in the book of Matthew? I believe so. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Because Matthew writes that when these cosmic signs are in, seen in the sky, after the tribulation of and or distress of those days, he will send forth his angels and gather his elect. Come on, is that really written there? It is in black and white. Let's look at it. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. Verse 29. Immediately after, notice that, the distress, the tribulation, we are told this chronological time period, immediately after the great tribulation of those days, the distress, the sun will be darkened. Isn't that exactly what we've seen in the book of Revelation and the book of Isaiah? And the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, can, can the Lord Jesus get any clearer? He's telling, when you see that happen, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in this. I wonder what that is. Is that a cross we see in, this, in the sky? Is it the Lord Jesus appearing in the air over the top of the Mount of Olives, as in uh, the book of Zechariah, chapter 12 and chapter 14? We don't know. We're left to wonder what the sign of the Son of Man will be seen. And all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And oh, how you will weep if you're in Jesus Christ. And see that sign, oh, you will weep, but it won't be weeping with mourning. It will be weeping with joy. Because finally the time has arrived when we will see the Lord and be with him forever. Verse 31, categorical, clear as a bell. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other, after the cosmic signs, the sixth seal, cosmic signs. So after several cosmic signs at the opening of the sixth seal, the angels will gather the elect. We're talking about everyone who's born again of God, uh, John 3, verse 3, and they will be seen in heaven 
before the throne. We'll look at that in chapter 7. We have two passages that we'll look at. First of all, the 144,000 from the nation of Israel, and the great multitude is seen. So the third possibility, there's another possibility. The third possibility as to the cause of the cosmic signs could be that the wrath of God is beginning to be released on the earth. We have already seen that at the opening of the fifth seal, those believers who were martyred cried out to God for him to bring judgment on those who were murdering believers. I'm talking about Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. And how did the Lord reply to them? Wait just a little bit longer, he said to them. These cosmic signs in the sky may be one last warning to earth's inhabitants before the final seal is opened and the back-to-back -back event of the rapture and the wrath of God begins to be poured out for the rest of the seven-year period. In an online article, a Bible teacher, Charles Cooper, writes these words, and I quote, The prophet Joel promised that the day of the Lord, we haven't had a chance to get into what Joel talks about. The day of the Lord, and by that we're talking about the eschatological wrath of God, begins after the unique portents in the sky and on earth occur. The grouping of these unique events occurs in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 14, and is specifically named as such. No other occurrence of this unique set of events appears in the book of Revelation. The portents indicate that the outbreaking of God's wrath is imminent. It is difficult to understand why John would put the indicator of God's imminent wrath five seals later than his actual beginning if there was a pre-tribulation rapture. Why would, why would the cosmic signs be after five seals? No. The idea that God's wrath will begin imperceptibly and build to a great climax is an invention of theological necessity without a biblical base. Let's move on. Sixth seal. We're back to our Revelation chapter 6 and finishing off the verses of this chapter. Sixth seal, panicked anticipation of the wrath of God. What does it say? Verse 15. We're looking at the kings of the earth now and their response to the cosmic signs that they are now seeing. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from what? The wrath of the Lamb. For, don't miss that, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it? We are here told plainly that those elites that are around and has been destroying the earth uh, are now seeing, uh-oh, we're in trouble. The wrath of God is now coming. So, I'll ask you another question. In your own words, share about who you think is hiding from God. Verse 16. Why are the mighty and rich mentioned specifically? How will these events level humankind? Go for it. So who are those that are hiding? By this time, the gospel will have been preached to every creature, and we are involved in that, getting Bible studies out to 20, nation, 20 languages. 
But at this time, I believe that to, to, the whole world will know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and those who are not in Christ, it will be because they have totally rejected and uh, they refuse. There are some evil beings that absolutely hate the name of our God and his Messiah. They cannot stand that name. And uh, those will be the ones who will look to hide as if they can hide from who? The Lamb. That's a paradoxical statement, isn't it? Who are they hiding from? They're hiding from their Creator, the Lord God Almighty, who sits upon the throne, but they are also hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 16. You and I, when we think of a lamb, we think of, oh, Jesus, meek and mild, wouldn't hurt a fly, and he's the lover of everyone. But it's such a paradoxical statement. There will come a time, and I'm sure he looks on what's happening to the innocent beings, children all over, and, and his anger is pent up, I believe, and at one point, we will see his wrath uh, being revealed uh, on the earth. And, and I trust that none of us will, will be on earth to see that. But there will be some that reject this message of a free pardon for their sin. And they say, no, I'm not turning to him. I will not bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of of the Lamb will be revealed. Here's what Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says these words, powerful words, words that I, when I first read them, I still remember as a young Christian reading about this. How can this be? Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, verse 8, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They, those who refuse this pardon, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Oh God, pour out your mercy. Now, before that day comes, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. How sad to see such anger and hatred exhibited by those who refuse to bow the knee to our Savior. These panicked people have lived their lives in rebellion against God and they refuse to repent. They would rather die than bend the knee to the Lordship of Christ. For every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2 verse 11. What an insult to the one who offers the children of man a complete pardon. The judgment of them shall be terrible. It is, Hebrews 10 verse 31 says, it is a dreadful and fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And this has been the problem with humanity from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve hid from the Lord. There are those that have been hiding from God all their lives. And we pray, if you're hearing this and you're still hiding from the Lord God Almighty and from his Wonderful pardon, his free pardon, won for us at the cross of Jesus through the substitutionary sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross. He, the love of God extended to us that day that he would wipe out every sin that we have ever committed, but there are still those who try to find a cave or hide from the wrath of the Lamb. Sin will always cause us to hide from the Creator, which was what happened in the Garden of Eden. When they sinned, what did they do? 
They went and hid from the Lord. Adam, Adam, where are you? Those words resonate through all eternity up to this point. And God is calling you and I, come, come to this wonderful banquet of salvation. The only way to deal with sin is to acknowledge our sin and to turn from it and re receive the forgiveness of the Lord. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we stay in our rebellion and do not bring our sin into the light, our hearts become hardened before the Lord and we run from his presence. But there is no cave or place to hide from the Lord. He sees all and he knows all. So at the breaking of the sixth seal and the cosmic signs, the enemies of God acknowledge that the time of judgment has now come, and they have refused the pardon. Now at the breaking of the seventh seal, which we will look at next time, uh, the wrath of God and the day of the Lord will begin, and at the same time the rapture. The wrath of God didn't start years previously, as the pre-tribulation teaching would suggest. God's word says that it begins at the breaking of the seventh seal and right after the sixth seal, cosmic signs. So one last question. I've got 10 minutes left. How does one prepare internally for the coming of the Lord and, and for whatever believers may have to experience in the last. How do you prepare for such things? Think in terms of preparing your heart, your values, and your habits. We have a diagram that we can put up so that you can look at it and, and look. The first three and a half years is the beginning of sorrows. And then after the midpoint, like we said, the abomination of desolation, when you see that event, then will take place the great tribulation or the great distress, according to whichever translation you use. Now, I had to put the arrow symbolizing the rapture at some point, but really we don't know at what point the rapture will take place because no man knows the day nor the hour when he will come. But I had to put it on the diagram somewhere. But God's wrath starts when the rapture takes place. It's a back-to-back -back event. We've already gone through those scriptures in Luke 17, I think it is. It talks about that. It gives two examples of, of the days of Noah when they got into the boat. Then the door was shut and the rain came. And the second example was the days of Lot. The very same day that Lot was taken out of Sodom, then the fire came down. Both of those examples spoken of by the Lord Jesus indicate that it's a back-to-back -back event. The rapture takes place, the salvation of God's people, and then the wrath of God will take place. So hence the diagram above. So we don't know at what stage these things will happen when the Lord will appear. There are not two churches, as some people say. There is not a Gentile church and a Jewish church, and the two shall not meet, and the Jews are the ones that are going to do the evangelism. In the No. Uh, putting that whole responsibility onto the Jewish believers, that is so totally alien to the Scriptures, for we are one body. We've been all brought into one covenant, Jews and Gentiles, and we'll look at that in the next chapter, chapter 7. I do not give any credence to the end-time view as described in the Left Behind series of books. No matter how many books they sell, it is a fallacy, and it is... In my humble opinion, you, you believe what you want, but I think you're going to be disappointed if you think that the rapture will take place before any signs or any trouble. Well, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. 
But I look at the scriptures over 47 years now, and, and I have read and studied a lot on this topic. I think you, you're aware of that. Jews and Gentiles are together made spotless because of the blood covenant Jesus instituted at the cross of Calvary. There are not two churches. And our God will not allow us. He showed us this in the, the plagues of Egypt. He was well able to keep those people, his people, in the midst of all the plagues that hit. And he has promised us, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you even till the end of the age. Really, he's going to be with us until he comes. He is there where two or three gather together. There am I in the midst of me. He is not a dead savior, brothers and sisters. I'm sure you all know that. He's a living savior, and he is well able to take care of us. He will sustain us and give us his grace for whatever is ahead for his saints. There's a story told by Corrie ten Boom, and I just love it, and it comes to mind to illustrate this point. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch woman during the Second World War. Her father owned a watch shop in Harland, Holland, when World War II broke out. And this Christ-like family began providing hiding places for Jewish people, persecuted Jews. She lived through many trials and persecution when her family went into a concentration camp because of the help that they offered to the Jews. At one point, Corrie was afraid and did not think she could handle what was ahead. Her father asked her, Corrie, when you and I go to Amsterdam, when do I give you your ticket? She replied, why, just before we get on the train. Exactly, he replied. And our wise Father in heaven knows when we are going to need these things. When the time comes that you need strength, you will look into your heart and find the strength you need just in time. God will give you what you need when you need it. So, brothers and sisters, we are not to be fearful of the things we read. God has given us his word because he wants to reveal these things to us so that when we see them, we will be encouraged and know exactly what's going on. Light in the midst of darkness. Brothers and sisters, we know who wins. We've read the end of the book, and it will happen just as our God and Lord has told us exactly we will finally see true justice. The whole creation groans awaiting his coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Stand with me and let's pray. Thank you, Father, for showing us these things before they happen. We have this sure prophetic word that it will happen just as you have said. It is not possible that you can lie you are true to your word, and it will happen according to your word, Lord. And we, we are satisfied in our hearts that you will take us uh, to that very place you've told us, where you go, you've told us you go ahead to prepare a place for you. And Father, we look forward to that day when we will stand before you and before our Messiah, the Lord Jesus, and we will be completely white as snow with a robe of righteousness that's been bought for us at the cross of Christ. Thank you, Father. Continue to live in us and, and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week, same time, same place.